Hello coders! Today we're talking about the hematic, lymphatic, mediastinum, and diaphragm surgery. This is only a few pages in your CPT book, but it is important. There aren't a lot of guidelines, but the guidelines that are there must be carefully followed if you're going to be working in this area of medicine. We also don't have a ton of main terms here because the majority of this is going to be the spleen, because remember the spleen is considered a blood pool. So it has a couple of major functions. The two major functions that deal with the blood system is it's a blood pool, meaning it holds on to extra blood. Depending on um, how old you are, it could be a half a cup to a cup. It also helps destroy old red blood cells. The third part that it deals with is helping us with our immune system. So this kind of goes all together. So that's why they put the spleen in the hematic, lymphatic, mediastinum, and diaphragm section, because the spleen, again, is a blood pool. Remember, hematic pertaining to blood. So when we look for our surgical procedures, we can look for things like a splenectomy. Um, we can also look for an anatomic site. For instance, bone marrow is going to be a big one. We can also look up things like spleen. Um, and we can look up the name of the condition. So we're, if we're doing a transplantation, we can look up transplantation. So the big main terms we're going to be looking under are going to be spleen, bone marrow, transplantation, lymph nodes, lymphadenectomy, diaphragm, and mediastinum. So let's look at what we have for our codes. So this is on page 271. You can see up here, hematic and lymphatic systems, spleen. We only have four spleen uh, codes for the excision repair. We have one laparoscopic code and then an unlisted code. So if we're removing the spleen, we need to know we're removing it in total or partial. And then here's another one of these nice little add-on codes, which is when we are removing the spleen in conjunction with another procedure. So if let's say we are doing a, um, a, pancre uh, a, a pancreatectomy, we're removing the pancreas, and they decide to remove the spleen at the same time, we would code for the type of pancreatectomy, and then we would add on 38102, okay? Versus if we're just doing the splenectomy by itself, then it depends, are we doing 38? 100, 38101, are we doing the laparoscopic procedure, 38120. And like all other sections, it has to say with a scope or it have to say something like laparoscopy for us to code for the scope procedure. So keep that in mind. We also have one repair code for the spleen, uh, the repair of the ruptured spleen, and again, with or without partial splenectomy. And the reason why we have so few codes is because the most common procedures are just the removal of the spleen, usually due to traumatic accident and injury. We have an injection procedure for what we call a spinoportography. So, and anytime we see graphy, radiology and in this case it's telling us for radiological supervision interpretation use 75810. So when we do a lot of these procedures especially when we're looking in vessels which the splenoporto is talking about the vessels that go in and out of the spleen okay um, what we do is we have to have an injection for how we're getting the drug into the system. We're going to have a code from the drug, and then we're going to have radiology, in this case, separate. Sometimes it's a combo code, other times it's not. So again, this is why we always read all the notations underneath, because in this case, it's telling you exactly which code you use, 75810, in radiology to pair with our injection procedure. Then we get to our bone marrow and stem cell services and procedures. So, a couple of things we need to know. This is going to include the management of finding a person. This is going to be freezing, this is going to be thawing, and this is going to be acquisition, okay, as well as transplantation. So, there's going to be codes for all of these things. Codes 38207 and 38215 describe various steps used to preserve, prepare, and purify bone marrow and stem cells prior to transplantation or reinfusion. Each code may be reported only once per day, regardless of the quantity of bone marrow or stem cells manipulated. 
So we can do one of two things. We can do what we call an autologous uh, transplantation. That is when the bone marrow is coming from the same patient. So what they do is they remove it from the patient, usually from the iliac crest, from the hip bone. They put it in a specialized machine that cleans the bone marrow, and then they put it back. They reinfuse it into the same person. That's one way. The other way is to get a transplantation from another person. That would be the allogenic. Because uh, remember, allo means another person. So you can see here, the first code is for the donor search and acquisition. Because again, we have to match, we have to make sure this bone marrow isn't going to be rejected by the patient. So again, what specifically are we doing? The other thing that we can do here is we can remove different parts of the cell. You can see here we have thawing from previously frozen. We can also do tumor cell depletion, red blood cell removal, platelet depletion, plasma depletion. So this is going to depend on specifically what does that patient need. And the hematologist um, is going to help us with this. It also could be an oncologist because they work very closely together. Remember, hematology is the study of blood. Oncology is the study of tumors. So again, we could be doing this because of a blood disorder, or we could be doing this because of cancer. Um, and then there's a lot of other reasons, but those are the two big ones. So specifically, what are we doing to the blood or the bone marrow? Um, to make sure that we are getting the patient exactly what they're getting in their body. Now, they have updated some codes. So 38220 is now the diagnostic bone marrow aspirations. And then we have 38221, which are biopsies. The difference between an aspiration and a biopsy, an aspiration is a lot smaller than a biopsy. But they added a new code in this year for when we do a biopsy and aspiration at the same time. So what they've done is they've revised codes to reflect the different types of procedures that these doctors are doing. And this is why we do have revised and new codes every year. As procedures become more specific, as providers get better with uh, figuring out how to perform these procedures in slightly different techniques, we then get updated and revised codes. So again, down here, 38230, bone marrow harvesting for transplantation allogenic. That's another person. Versus autologous, which is the patient. Remember, auto means self. Think autopsy. In autopsy, what we're doing is we're viewing self, meaning we're looking at a person. We're looking at what ourselves look like. So that's where the term auto comes from. Allo is just another person. Could be someone related or unrelated. Now, along with these, we have these newer procedures that have been around uh, since the uh, early 2000s for what we call HCT and HPC. So let's go through what these are and when we use them. So uh, hematopoietic cell transplantation refers to the infusion of hemopoietic progenitor cells obtained from bone marrow, peripheral blood apheresis, and or umbilical cord blood. So when they're talking about the hemopoietic progenitor cells, these are similar to um, stem cells, okay? And they're similar to stem cells, meaning that we're looking for the immature cells that help grow the bone marrow. And so we can get them from the patient's own bone marrow, from other people's bone marrow, from what we call peripheral blood apheresis, which is removing blood and actually extracting this, from the blood and or umbilical cord blood from a newborn baby, or again, a lot of parents have saved their umbilical cord, so this could be a frozen umbilical cord that was then thawed where they could get these cells from. Now, the difference between the codes we've just been looking at and these codes is that these procedures include physician monitoring of multiple physiological parameters, physician verification of cell processing, evaluation of the patient during as well as immediately before and after the HPC lymphocyte infusion, and physician presence during the HPC lymphocyte infusion with associated direct physician supervision of clinical staff and management of uncomplicated adverse events such as nausea, nausea or or uticaria uh, during the infusion, which is not separately reporting. So basically, the provider is here. 
okay? The hematologist is there. They're in the exact same office, the exact same part of the facility where the patient is. They're overseeing the nursing staff, and they are checking in on the patient before, during, and after. But it goes on to tell us on the next page, you can see right here, again, this is where we go in to get that biopsy. HCT must be, uh, may be autologous when the HPC donor and recipient are the same person or allogenic when the HPC donor and recipient are not the same person. So again, what we're going to see here is we need to know, again, is it the HPC or is it the lymphocyte infusion? Okay, we need to know if it's allogenic and autologous. And then we have a special code, uh, code 38243 called the HPC boost. And that's what starts right here. The H, uh, so it's telling us that again, these can be, you know, reported. The regular codes for the uh, transplantation can be reported anytime. However, some of these patients will need a boost. This could be days, weeks, months, or years afterwards. So they tell us, uh, code 3243 is used to report an HPC boost from the original allogenic HPC donor. A lymphocyte fusion or HPC boost can occur day, months, or even years after the initial hemopoietic cell transplant. HPC boost represents an infusion of hemopoietic progenitor cells from the original donor that is, be used, that, that is being used to treat post-transplant cytopenias. So remember, cyto is cells. Cytopenias, again, we're probably talking about blood cells. Again, context clues here. So the biggest thing is none of these codes should be reported together on the same date because you're either doing a transplantation of either autologous or allogenic or you're doing the HPC boost. You can't be doing both on the same day. And again, it goes on, if there is a separately and significant identifiable e &M service on the same day, we can use the e &M codes Again, with modifier 25. Now, it goes on to tell us that um, similarly, infusions of any medications concurrent with the transplant infusion are not separately reported. However, hydration or administration of medications like antibiotics or narcotics unrelated to the transplant are separately reported using modifier 59. Okay, so again, if we're giving a medication that goes with the transplant, perhaps it's a medication that will help the patient not reject that transplant, that is included in these codes. But if we are hydrating the patient, if we're giving them any other drugs that are not directly related to the infusion, it can be separately reported. And we use modifier 59 to say it is separate and distinct from the transplantation procedures or infusion procedures that we're doing. And that's it. That is the hematic system. There's not a lot of codes. And again, you can look under hematic, you can look under bone marrow, you can look under transplant. Um, you know, again, what specifically is your provider doing? Now, then we get to the lymph nodes and the lymphatic channels, okay? And these don't really have any guidelines to go with them. So what we're looking for is what are we doing? Are we doing a drainage? Are we making an incision, a lymphangiotomy? Are we suturing one of the, the ducts? The biggest thing that I'm going to tell you, and you'll see some of my highlights here, where are we going? So we have a biopsy or excision of lymph nodes. But where are the lymph nodes? Are they deep cervical? Okay. Are they deep axillary? Are they internal mammary? Are they deep jugular? Where are we going to remove these lymph nodes? Okay. So, or do a biopsy excision, either one. We can do a biopsy or an excision. So again, we need to know where are the lymph nodes here. We also have, um, ooh, there we go. Hold up. Okay. We also have some laparoscopic procedures. Again, all of these are open. It even says open deep cervical, open deep axillary. So this is when we're slicing into the body and we're going and removing those nodes. Uh, the codes over here, you can see you start with laparoscopy. If we're laparoscopically removing these, again, we need to know that it's done with a scope and we need to know again, where are we removing these lymph nodes? And that's basically it. The thing that you may see here, of course, 
is the word radical. We've talked a little bit about radical here and there. Anytime you see the word radical, it means they're removing surrounding tissue and lymph nodes. So if it's a radical lymphadenectomy, they're removing the lymph nodes and the surrounding tissue. And usually the reason why we're doing radical procedures are because of cancer. And so the radicalness of the procedure, the, the lymph nodes and the tissue surrounding the area is to make sure the cancer doesn't infiltrate that area. Um, however, you know, we can have other issues, other diagnoses that would lead us to still have to do a radical resection. Trauma could be a good reason too. And that's it for the lymphatic nodes and lymphatic channels. It's very, very simple. Then we come up to the mediastinum and diaphragm. So remember, the mediastinum is in the thoracic cavity. The diaphragm is what separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So the first thing that we're going to see is we're going to see the mediastinotomies, the incisions, but again, approach. So we can go cervical through the neck, transthoracic, okay, through the chest, or median sternotomy, which is going through the middle part of the sternum to get to this area. We can also do excisions where we can remove things like cysts and tumors, which we see up here. Um, we can also do endoscopies to go in and do biopsies. So there's not much we do, and we can just look up mediastinum for these. That's going to be our main term. All these codes will be listed underneath. Similar things for diaphragm. But I want to show you this. So we're going to be talking about digestive in another chat. But before we get there, I want you to be careful about the differences between the diaphragmatic hernias and the hernias that we see in other parts of the body. So the diaphragmatic hernias are usually the stomach pushing up through the diaphragm itself. Um, that is the most common. So what happens is sometimes babies are actually born like that, where the diaphragm didn't completely close all the way, and so the stomach is in a weird position. So we have to be careful. So we have a repair of the laceration of the diaphragm, but then you'll see here, 39503, repair neonatal diaphragmatic hernia with or without chest tube insertion, with or without creation of ventral hernia. And then right here, do not report modifier 63 in conjunction with 39503. Remember, when the code descriptor says the word neonatal, you can't use modifier 63. Modifier 63 is for babies less than 8.8 .8 pounds. So the assumption is a neonate in general is less than 8.8 .8 pounds. Now we all know that there are babies born that are 9, 10, 11, 12 pounds, but those are far rarer than babies who are born under 8.8 .8 pounds. Now, we've got it for neonates, and then other than neonatal, this is a traumatic acute, and then there's a code for chronic. But be careful, because we also have what we call paraesophageal hernia. The paraesophageal hernia, this is inside the esophagus, and it's usually Further down, it's near what we call the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter. And this is swollen, twisted veins inside the esophagus. So it's it, they're called esophageal varices. And they're very similar to uh, the same kind of twisted, swollen veins that we get in the rectum and anus. But again, they're in a slightly different area. So again, they're telling us we're going to go to digestive for those. This is just for the diaphragmatic hernias. And that's really it, guys. There's not a lot to this. Um, so the big thing is making sure that we get the exact procedure and that we look out for timing. So for instance, for the uh, for the bone marrow, we want or the HPCs, we need to make sure again what type and what day are we on. Is this the initial or is it a boost? For the rest of these procedures, it's really what is the specific procedure that we need to use to describe what we're doing for the patient. Hey guys, good luck on this section.